Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today for this fantastic workshop. For the love of burning art with kinetic fire sculptors, Glenn Todd, Axel Chenzi and Melissa Carey. I'd like to start by paying respect to the traditional and original owners of the lands we're all calling in from today and to acknowledge today's Australian Aboriginal community who are the traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of this land. I wish to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and the members of the Australian Aboriginal community who are attending this event today. Uh, you can donate to the Fire Sticks Alliance Indigenous Corporation, which Glenn is in full support of, uh, who are providing Indigenous leadership training, advocacy and action to protect country through cultural fire and land management practices. Uh, Fire Sticks acknowledges country and traditional custodians and serves under their authority and the link to donate to them uh, is on the event page that you clicked through. And uh, it's with my absolute pleasure I get to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Glenn, Axel and Melissa. Uh, this is a two-stage workshop. It goes for two hours and it's an overview mm -hmm. on their thoughts of the extensive list of things that uh, they've put down on how to think about, plan, design, build and deliver fire artworks. Glenn says that each dot point that was listed on the event page is a whole day workshop in itself. So this is a teaser on each point to help you think about what you might need to do more research on in order to make some fantastic and safe burnable art. I'm Kat, I'm the lead for Artery this year and I'm very pleased to have you all here. Over to you, Glenn. Hey, I'm just uh, sharing the run sheet on the, it, which is on the main event page. So if you wanna click through to that, I just put it on the chat so you can follow us what we're doing. Okay, so the intro to pitching for Friday night. So Artery has heaps of workshops and support leading up to the event. So we won't be talking about actual putting a proposal together. Um, I more wanted to talk about the format of Friday night at Burning Seed Festival. So we have the iconic Sunday and Sunday uh, burns. So I started doing uh, burns on Friday simply because no one else was, and I wanted to. Um, and it's my favorite scale to work at, five meters and below. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why for that. And for, for example, uh, Melissa wanted to do a burn. So she applied last year and um, was able to do one. Uh, now we struggle having uh, more nights at burning seeds. So burning on a Thursday or Wednesday night, for example. Yeah. Now under, under all the massive safety infrastructure that you see, there's far more behind the scenes. There's a lot of people that are straight edge managing their sleep for three nights, three days, keep everyone safe. So we simply don't have the capacity to scale that up. It's just too much to ask of those people to do another night. Uh, unless, so unless we get massive influx of that sort of infrastructure, we can't do more nights. Um, um, but what we could do is do multiple burns on the Friday night. There's nothing stopping us doing, um, say, six smaller burns. And um, so that's sort of one of the things we're pitching in the vision. Now, what's stopping us from doing that is there's no one pitching. Um, so we are hoping as part of this workshop and a lot of other work, there's a lot of work behind the scenes of working on diversity and inclusion and trying to bring more artists and um, more diverse people into, the, into this space. So this workshop's part of that um, and we're hoping to reframe the Friday night. So um, yeah, so hopefully you've inspired enough to, um, to hopefully we can reshape that Friday night. Over to Melissa. Hi everyone, I'm so glad you're here and I hope you get lots out of this workshop. Um, just a quick background on myself. Um, I'm actually a full-time practicing artist and last year at Burning Seed was my first kind of major fire art piece. And so I'm just gonna share like today my experience in like my art background as well um, and building background and then how that relates to burning seed sculpture. So the first topic uh, we're gonna talk on is where to start concepts and developing your idea. <clears throat> so um, everyone works differently. Um, the way that I work in, in terms of coming up with ideas and having um, like a really well-developed idea um, is that I, I like researching, I like looking at other artists for um, inspiration to start with, 
and then I like pulling together like textures and different materials and different um, methods of building that I like. Um, and then I, I think about um, like what is this work going to mean to me? Um, and I, I, I really think it's important to have a really good meaning for the work. Um, and then just writing that down so that people can understand like what your artwork uh, symbolises so that they can connect with it. Um, so there, there are a couple of the, the ways that I start with. Um, and then I also, at the concept stage, start to think about how I'm going to build it. Um, so they're just a couple of key points on developing concepts. Um, and yeah, go for it. Think wild. Um, don't let um, anything stop you from creating, like thinking creatively because um, as artists, um, I think it's kind of our job to think out the box and push the borders of things. So, yeah, that's all on that topic for me. Is Axel going to comment on that? Where's Axel going? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Um, I've been involved in Burning Seed for well, 20, since 2017 uh, when I worked on Glenn's crew. Um, and I've since done the um, temple and the effigy. Uh, which are quite large builds and quite complicated. Um, from sort of the get-go, you need to understand, um, especially if you're, if you're designing something for um, the environment out there, you need to understand, you know, how long it's going to take you and, you know, um, where it's going to go, I guess. Um, if we're talking specifically about... Um, the development of the concept, I just say get as much, like show it to as much people as possible and get as much advice from people who have done it as possible. Um, because, you know, you can have like a really wild sort of idea at the start, but it might just get keep getting paired back and paired back and paired back. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things when you just, when you're coming up with a concept and you want to do it. You want to you want to sort of talk to as many people as possible who have done similar things, um, and especially specifically at if you're going to do something for burning seed, you want to talk to people who have built out there before, um, so that you know you've got a bit of an idea of what's involved, the logistics of how to get stuff out there, uh, and you might start with this idea in your head, but by the time you talk to all of these different people you might go in a completely different direction or, you know, you might drag people in who are inspired to take it in a different direction as well. So, you know, collaborate, get as much as you can as far as outside influences into it as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's probably the main thing I would say is just get advice from people who have done it before. Um, yeah. Yeah, my um, creative process is probably two two approaches. One, um, I just daydream a lot when I'm in festival environments. So a lot of the time, concepts I've got in my head, either there or on the way home. Uh, and then the other approach is maybe a little bit more of a traditional approach where I'm looking at intent, what the story that I'm trying to tell, um, and then actually refine that over a you know a creative process. Drawing and using 3D software. All right. Um, so when I'm developing my idea, um, I actually really like using mood boards, um, like pulling together lots of different images um, to show what direction I would be going. And I love the old uh, pencil sketch. So... Um, for Burning Seed last year, for example, um, that's what I did in my submission. I did a mood board um, and then I did a sketch of what my artwork would look like and symbolise. Um, you don't need to do a 3D model to pitch your idea and win it. Um, you can just 
stick to basics and do sketches. Um, for complex designs, um, such as the effigy and temple, then a 3D model would be um, ideal. Um, so yeah, if, I, if I've got a complex design, I need to work out some elements before I'm gonna submit it, or I, I just need to show like a 3D version because sculpture is 3D and sometimes hard to show in just a 2D pencil drawing. Um, so yeah, 3D modeling can be really effective for that. Um, and SketchUp is quite easy to learn. Um, you can do some really amazing stuff with that. Um, yeah, that's all on that topic for me. Over to you, Axel. Yeah, I might, um, you know, comment on that SketchUp as well. Um, it's the program that I use, um, and I started using it a couple of years ago. Um, first of all, just to sort of um, do some concept design type stuff. Um, but I found it really, really helpful to um, visualize as well as, you know, show people what, what you're talking about as far as, you know, your, your concept design. And like Mel said, it's a, it's a fairly easy program to use and you can just, you can basically just do like some YouTube tutorials and, you know, it's, um, it's supported by Google. So you can type in any sort of silly sort of question in any sort of way and Google will just throw up like an answer for you and, and be able to sort of walk you through it. Um, I find it really um, good because I'm from a sort of building background so I like to develop all of my designs so that I can see how they go together. So it's a lot easier on site specifically. Um, and yeah, it's good to have developed drawings so that you can show um, the engineering to people as well. Um, a lot of the times when you are doing a sort of art piece or a burning art piece, you'll need to, you know, tick a lot of boxes as far as safety. Um, so you need to just make sure that everything is sort of detailed up. Um, it it all, all depends on the type of sculpture that you're doing, um, basically. Um, but yeah, I, I would suggest definitely having a little bit of a dabble into SketchUp to get you started. Yeah, for me, um, I always start with pen and paper, pencil. Um, just to scribble out roughly ideas and things. Um, computers take time, so sketching is just faster. I used to use Illustrator mainly because I just was trained in that um, for another um, role that I do. Um, but 2D in a 3D space is problematic. Um, so then I moved to making 3D models, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, which I really recommend that you start with uh, if you aren't experienced building in 3D spaces. And then recently I've just invested in learning Fusion 360 and the, which is a steep learning curve and it's very complex and time consuming. However, the, the ability as an artist has gone exponential and it really is a superpower um, in designing 3D. So I haven't actually designed anything in 3D that I've burnt yet. Um, so previous stuff was models and 2D. But um, yeah, if you're really serious, um, it will give you superpowers, but it's a huge investment. Structural integrity. All right. So following on from a bit of what Axel started talking about, um, it's really important to think about the structural integrity in the beginning. Um, so, you know, maybe once you've kind of developed your concept and maybe you've won a grant, um, it's really important to think about um, like the scale. So, um, if you're going to build large, for example, five metres, um, you'll need some en structural en engineering input unless you've got a background in that. Um, so some of the things related to that is that you need to have a really solid foundation, so a really strong um, core of the sculpture, depending on what you're building, but you still, like, if you're going to go up and out, um, you still need to have a really strong foundation. And you need to factor in the wind component. So especially at burning 
received, there's extremely um, high winds, up to 45 knots, I think it was, at the last festival. Um, so that's where the structural engineering comes in because um, they know how to work out the tolerances um, and to make sure that your core frame, um, especially because it's out of timber, needs to be strong enough to withhold uh, any winds and not fall down. And also the weight factors. So if you're going um, high and out, like for example, the wings, um, you need to factor in the weight of all of the timber um, and how, how that's gonna be held up um, and in relation to the high wind too. So there's a few factors um, that are really important in making sure that your sculpture um, is strong and sturdy and there's a lot of people at the festival so it's it's important to think about the safety of others when you're building um, and also people love climbing at festivals as I'm sure you all know so it's just in another factor to think about when you're building a sculpture if someone's going to want to hang off one of the wings for example and climb it um, it needs to be strong enough to hold um, their weight um, or you just make it so people can't climb it if that's something you don't um, want to risk. Um, and, yeah, uh, another thing I just wanted to mention about that is, like, with structural engineers, um, they can be quite um, set in their minds. So they have, like, you know, they think in their little square. And as artists, I think it's really important that we push push the, the limits a little bit. So when I've worked with structural engineers in the past for some projects, I've said, I want to make this. And they're like, no. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> we need to work out how. So there's always, there's always a way. It's just working out how. Um, so just on that, I, from my experience, I've just learnt that it's really important to find people who are actually willing to think outside the box um and so that you can make something epic <laughs> over to you axel yeah just to uh, really reiterate your point there about um you know making sure that you're designing for the particular spot um, where it's going to be and you should be able to find someone to give you advice on the materials at least at the concept stage um at least you know if, if you decide to design some crazy spiral that, you know, is just not going to structurally hand, like hang up itself, um, then you should be able to ask, you know, build a friends or anyone around before you get to the structural engineer stage, you should be able to work out whether your concept is doable. And, and then when like you'll get down the road a little bit with your materials as well. Um, and sort of the structural engineer is like, down the track a little bit um, when when you come when you're just doing like all of your start out stuff you should be able to ask if any anyone can have a look at it who is like a builder or you know you should be able to find someone pretty easily to tell you if it's um, crazy what you've designed or um, or something like that but you know any, anything above five meters like Mel said especially if you're having it installed at an event like a festival and it's made out of timber. Um, most of the time, these things are going to be built um, by you or by volunteers. So you, so you need to just have like, uh, you know, an engineer just to sign it off, just to make sure that, you know, that's, there's nothing going to go wrong and, you know, it's going to stay up there and be safe. What about Glenn? Yeah. Um, so for me, one of the big aspects of this art, is gravity like you're trying to um, build something that withstands gravity and so that really informs a lot of the design process for me um, so having a concept is one thing but then have being able to have a concept that's going to stand up against gravity is is a big part of our artwork um, so if you're struggling with that then be cool because that is the challenge that is the art that is the you know the artwork itself I also want to mention as well how materials and physics don't scale. So up to around about five metres, timbers behave as you think they would behave. 
once you get bigger than that, then they start behaving differently. Um, they become um, more bendy and less strong. Um, and also to, there's more weight involved. So for example, when we, um, we lifted up some, some 40 mil big solid Cypress logs, um, 10 metre frame, it behaved like paper, literally curved when we were craning it, um, which was phenomenally weird that such solid timbers were just bending like paper. Um, so it is, in my opinion, building something 10 metres is six times, 10 times more harder than building something that's five metres. Which is why if you're um, new to the, you know, this is your first piece, I'd recommend, you know, maybe looking at five metres rather than doing a 12 metre effigy. Not saying you shouldn't give it a go, of course, but the complexity and the support and the help that you will need just simply because the things don't scale from five to 10 metres is a huge, huge difference in materials and how they behave and how you build. Um, yeah, so model making. All right, so I think it's really a great exercise to make a small model. Um, for me, it just really helps um, get the idea out of my head and actually physically see how I'm going to build it. And it also helps to like break down the different layers. So, you know, you've got your core foundations um, and then the like kind of the fillers. So especially because we're going to burn the artwork um, we want to make sure there's enough fuel load as well which we'll go into later but it's just another element of like the layering of the sculpture and then you've got your outside faces of the sculpture so all the pretty stuff so yeah it really helps me to just think about how I'm actually going to build it um, by making a small model and just an, a note on making models, even though you can do it to a small scale, um, you still need to think about the the extra elements like the that factor in. So, like Glenn was saying, when you go bigger, the materials act differently, um, and then you've got like to allow for forty five k winds. So it's it's hard to kind of test that on a very small model. Um, depending on what you're using to build the model. Um, so it's just something to think about. And it's also another way, if you're not gonna go down the path of um, doing it in 3D software, it's also a really good way to show people what you're making um, in, a, you know, in a little mini version. So yeah, I think it's a great process to do. You wanna to speak to that, Axel? I haven't actually done any um, model, like practical model making myself. I've only done um, computer modeling. That's sort of how I visualize things. Um, but yeah, I, I do see a, a big advantage in doing it. I've seen a lot of Glenn's models before. And I know I've worked on Glenn's crew where it's been really helpful to have a little model there just to see how everything's sort of worked and explained out and yeah, it's a great little um, tool for demonstrating what you're actually building to people as well. Yeah, I, I think um, model making is essential if you're um, starting out um, because it teaches a lot of structural engineering. You, you know, you'll build, you'll build something and then it's really weak and then you um, reinforce it and then you're learning how to structure engineer so it's huge uh, lessons it allows you to sketch in 3d really easily um, and i've got most of my models on my website for most of my builds so you'll be able to go and have a look at those models now i recommend that you use a scale one to ten is the best because it's easy maths um, if you've got some obscure um, scale you're going to be doing obscure maths the whole time so 1.5 or you know one to ten that sort of stuff um, and it's also really important um, for um, visual communication. And I think it's far better than 3D modeling. Um, when you're working with a team, especially if you're um, doing what Mel recommends and you're thinking outside the box, people just don't get it. Um, the model really allows them to, um, to understand it. And it's a great pitching tool. So I really recommend um, model making. Um, so I'll show you a quick kit, hot glue gun. 
<laughs> and bamboo sticks. Now that's 3D sketching. You can quickly, oh, I'm sorry, and use pliers just to cut it real quickly. Snap, snap, glue, glue, bang. You can build stuff really quickly. Um, and then you can also get fatter bamboo if you want to do things for scale. So then the next level up after I've done sketching, now I don't have it on me, but um, you can get heaps of different sized dowels from uh, hardware stores. So you can actually do your timbers to scale. Um, this saw here is really cheap. I think it's uh, eight bucks or something. This little vise is um, the same, about eight bucks. Um, and then PVA glue, um, so hot glue gun PVA glue. That is a really like 20 bucks. You've got a full model making kit. You can learn heaps of structure engineering and also using cardboard as well, different um, thicknesses of cardboard. You can actually cut out timbers, the thickness and the width of, and glue them all on and stuff like that. So I really recommend model making will exponentially make you a better engineer. The other thing as well is that if you, um, if it's really painful, putting your model together and you're getting frustrated, think about that when you're on site with cranes and people, it's going to be 10 times more hard. So it also makes you redesign and go, that's just too hard with a model. It's going to be too painful on site. So then you're also learning about how you can build things and structurally put them together. Um, now here's one that I struggle with budget and planning. <laughs> Over to Mel. All right. Um, so I'm going to start with the budget. And you'll actually need to submit your budget when you're pitching your idea to Burning Seed. So it's good if you're a beginner to start with all of everything we've covered so far um, because then it helps you work out your budget. Um, it's really important to think about all the aspects, everything that you would need to pay for. Um, if you're a beginner, and you haven't run kind of like any art projects like this before, uh, it's a good idea just to start small. Um, so you might have seen that Burning Seed have different levels of grants um, and Friday Now Art Burn has different levels as well. Um, so you could start with a small budget um, and then the year after try for a bigger budget and double it, for example. Uh, another thing to note as well is that um, Burning Seed doesn't actually fund the entire project. So you need to demonstrate that you're going to be doing other sources of fundraising or you're going to be chipping in um, for the budget too. Um, so that's just in the criteria. So like when I was planning out um, the Wild Heart um, sculpture, um, I just had to work out um, all the different avenues that I could raise money on the side as well as um, getting the grant, the funding from Burning Seed, um, which only covers materials um, and equipment and tools and transport, things like that. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to run through kind of quickly the elements of... Um, that are important in budgets. So you want to think about materials. Um, if you're going to be using recycled materials, which we tried to use as much as we could, um, you want to think about um, the fuel that you're going to need to drive and pick them up. Um, are you going to need to hire a trailer um, to get the, the actual materials onto site? Um, and think about the time involved um, to gather recycled materials. Um, I would really recommend using recycled materials um, for burning uh, where you can. And you want to make sure that for any of your structural timbers that there's no splits um, and not too much weathering. Um, and so, for example, we used some um, new materials for the core structure, uh, which was part of our budget. Another thing to think of is equipment. Um, for example, if you're building uh, a five metre sculpture, you'll need, you're required to have scaffolding. So you'll have to hire or borrow from somebody um, the scaffolding and bring it onto site. Uh, and then you'll need to factor in how you're going to get that there or is it going to be delivered. 
Um, some tools. You're going to need to bring all your own tools. Um, so you need to either, yeah, work out, um, factor that into the budget. Uh, transport and travel costs to the festival and back. Um, uh, the fuel load that you're going to use for actually um, prepping your sculpture to, to be lit on fire. And it's really important to uh, put a contingency in for any extra things that might pop up. Um, there's always something, every single project that I've done, there's always uh, surprises and extra costs. So I usually factor in 20% contingency. And then, yeah, you'll need to kind of factor in if you want to pay yourself, it needs to be outside the Burning Seed grant. Um, so if you want to do fundraising, which can uh, contribute to your time. Um, and so just a little bit on planning. Um, it's just really, really great to think about all the different stages of the build um, before you go onto site. Um, so for example, I had a team meeting before we went to the festival and we talked about how we were going to build it and making sure that everyone was like on board. Um, also, I like to, um, you know, check with um, experts. So I've got a bit of building experience, but I'm not a carpenter. So I usually have a carpenter on my team if I'm doing a lot of wood sculptures and I ask them for their, um, their skilled input on different elements. Um, if, you're, if you don't have much experience in building at all, um, then it's really important that you um, get some input into the build. Um, think about the impacts of like scale and your design. Um, and just, it's also good to think about like how to keep the work flowing every day. So you're going to be there building the sculpture for a number of days. Um, for example, um, for the Wild Heart, um, we spent six solid days building the sculpture and there was a team of five. So as the team lead, it's really important to like think about all the jobs um, that are coming up um, and then making sure that the team is like working effectively. Um, also uh, building the sculpture in different elements. So for example, we were building at, um, I think it was just five and a half metres. So we built it in sections. So the wings were in parts and then we added them on um, and then kept adding the wings in layers so it wasn't too heavy so that we didn't need a crane. And then we built the head separately down on the ground so that we could have different people working on different elements. And then once the head was finished, um, we raised it onto the sculpture. So, yeah, it's really important just to think ahead, think of all the different um, elements involved. Also, think, keep in mind the, the festival environment, um, even before the festival. Um, it can be really harsh conditions out there. Um, like it can be like, you can go from really hot days to suddenly freezing, raining and like really heavy winds. And you've only got limited days to build a sculpture in. So you need to think about the safety of your team um, and building as while you're building as well. Um, and yeah, have some contingency time in there. Um, yeah, just talk to people and try and plan it out as much as you can before you get there. Do you guys have any input on that? I might just speak to the budgeting a little bit. Um, yep. My kind of workflow when I'm doing a concept design is I'll look at the grant that um, I'm going for 
And then pretty early on, I'll do a bit of quantities on the materials. Um, a lot of the times, this might be speaking to a different sort of topic, but a lot of the times I'm looking at the material first and then looking how, how much that's going to cost um, to actually produce that art piece. So you can work out pretty quickly through your budget, once you start doing your budget, if, if you've got a viable design um, as far as, you know, if it's going to cost, you can design something. You don't want to get too far down the line of designing something and work out that it's ridiculously expensive, um, for instance. So I, I sort of, I sort of do my budget sort of in conjunction with my scaling of the piece as well as, you know, just the general design. Um, usually I'll find some materials that I want to use. Um, that are cheap or you know readily available and then that will go into a design so I like to suggest people think that think about the budget while you're doing the concept I think that's the only point that I wanted to make there yeah, I agree with, agree with that um, and also reiterate a fact something that Mel said is you need fat on your budget 20 to 30 percent as a minimum fat because on down out in the bush things go down um, even with 20 30 percent that always blow my budgets, um, which then I'm left to shoulder. Um, now, one of the reasons is that you're making changes on the site, so um, which goes back to what Axel says about good planning, um, but then sometimes it's hard to do that or something may not work or maybe you get a great idea while you're working on it and you want to change it. So those changes then are extra costs. Um, and Wagga, where we source our stuff from, is an industrial city. So there's a lot of um, access for artistic materials, but they're going to cost more than, say, Melbourne. So if you're changing things, you need materials last minute, um, or you're going to specialist shops and buying them new, it's going to be expensive. The other small costs are just your people. You know, you've got a big crew of volunteers. So, you know, you might be shouting beers here and there and other things like that, which, you know, makes it an experience. Um, and as Axel mentioned, recycling is really key to, to cut your budget for uh, there's many reasons, but recycling material, reuse material, waste material is just really um, a, a key way to keep your budgets down. The other thing is to research thoroughly materials. So for example, the fire seed, the pine from that, it was cheaper for me to hire a removable truck from Wagga, drive to um, Aubrey, buy from a supply and drive back than it was to get locally. Um, and the business I bought it from was a smaller business than the local Wagga one. So supporting local business in that context. Also, Mel mentioned is heights. Once you start working at heights, budgets get far more complex because safety, hiring of safety gear and cranes and scaffolding and all that stuff. So um, think about height, height, working at heights is a key um, thing you need to think about in design. And um, some tools are shared in, Bernie, uh, in the community. So depending on what you need, um, do, do talk to Artery and um, it is possible that maybe a certain um, thing that you only need a little bit of that you may be able to borrow. Um, but if the same you're using the whole time, then you'll definitely need to source your own tools. Um, yep, yeah, so planning I think um, is, is sort of the hard boring part, but it definitely is essential if you're working with other people in the budgets. Collaboration and building a team. All right, I'll take this one over. Um, so I guess I'll just um, speak to how my process, I guess, in how I do it. Um, and I come from a, a sort of a buildery background. So I've got a very, um, a practical way of thinking about the people that I need to fill the specific positions um, in my team. So, you know, if I'm a carpenter and I'm building a big wooden art project, I want a few carpenters on there. So I'll try and get some people who I know and trust. And um, I've been lucky enough to work with Glenn on a, on, um, a previous burning seed. So I just, sort of carried over some crew from them. Um, if you're starting out, um, it's, it's good to kind of um, find people who have worked in the similar sort of environment at Burning Seed, who have done builds before, um, who have been there before, and then, or, or, you know, 
who are used to working in a, um, a festival environment. I know Mel had some um, guys who came and helped um, who had been previously, you know, doing festival builds and stuff like that. Um, and then I like to try and um, build sort of a, a team that has varied skills. So you don't necessarily have to have any build experience to be on my team. You just have to be very enthusiastic and willing to learn. Um, and my, like, as far as collaboration, I like to bring, you know, fresh ideas in and I, I, like my designs aren't generally detailed up to a T. I like to have whoever's working on my team come in and, and do their little spin on my thing. Like you can see in the, in the background, I just had this girl who just took off on doing all these feathers and I didn't tell her how to do them. She just did them the way she wanted to do them. And, you know, the, the details like around here, that was just the guy who just decided that that's what he wanted to do for two weeks of the build. He wanted to cut out stuff. So um, it's all about um, creating an experience for those people um, within my team. And I generally try and make it a male-female balanced team. It doesn't always work out that way because of the um, skills that you might necessarily need. Um, women generally aren't in the construction industry as much as like blokes are or whatever. And it's, it's harder to get um, women to actually come out and, and do a heap of work on site. Um, but generally, I've been very, very lucky of being able to get um, last year I had 19 people on my crew and I think it was, it was balanced. It was completely balanced, including my dog. So my, my dog made up the extra, extra female, which made it completely balanced. So, um, yeah, it, I like to, um, develop a bit of a community around the build too. So with the structures that I do, they're fairly sizable. So I do a heap of pre-build stuff where I run um, workshops and generally what I'll do is I'll post the workshops, workshops up on Facebook and do a bit of promotion around them. And that gets anyone who's sort of in the burning seed community to who doesn't necessarily have the time or, you know, availability to come out on site and work for a couple of weeks or almost a month sort of thing they can come to a, one of these workshops and they can work on the effigy or work on the temple. And that's the way I like to build a community around it. And those people, they just sort of, they become extended crew and they also, um, I don't know, they feel like they're, they're part of one of the biggest sort of art structures on there. Um, so I really like to develop the community before the event and a lot of those, a lot of those people who come to those workshops don't necessarily have any skills until they come and do some work there as well. But then they they will be sort of part of a bigger sort of build, and that builds a community. And the collaboration between the community is really important, I think, with these sort of structures. So, yeah, I, I would suggest if you are building some sort of art structure, um, build, build a community around it, build a, build a Facebook um, like event and then have little workshops or whatever where people can come and involve themselves. And you might, you might find that people, uh, you might find people to be on your crew from those workshops. Like it's just a, it's, it's a nice sort of casting net, if you will, to, to find people who are interested. And a lot of the times you'll find people who, come every week to the workshop or, or come every couple of weeks to the workshop but can't be on site and they become part of your extended crew too. So, and they feel like they're part of that as well. So, yeah, that's how I would collaborate and that's how I would sort of find crew members and build workshops. That's about it. Would you want to talk to about? Yeah, I I definitely agree with Axel. Um, I'm I'm really passionate about building community around art, 
and I think it's a really beautiful way for people to um, learn some new things and have something have, have like an, a com an interest in common. Um, and you know, it's a festival which is about community. So you know, you like for me, it's important that my crew really want to come to that festival and understand it as well. Um, and yeah, what I found is like by when I did my um, some fundraising events um, for the sculpture to raise extra money for to pay for everything, um, just sharing my passion for my idea and what I wanted to do um, drew people into the project. And like Axel was saying, I had people helping um, just prepare it who didn't come to the festival, but they just really wanted to be involved. Um, even just volunteering at the fundraising event that I was running. Um, all of those people um, contribute to making the sculpture and the experience. And I think it's, um, for me, it's really important um, to find crew that align with my values um, and similar working style. Um, and also, I've learnt from experience that for me it's important um, just for people on my crew to be able to think outside the box um, because the kind of art that I make is not, you know, tables and chairs that are square, for example. So if, um, if someone just has a background in that, there can be some challenges um, if they're going to make something full of curves and, you know, that um, doesn't start with a, fr um, you know, in, in um, a structured way, for example. Um, I've just learned that it's good to pick people that, like, um, are kind of open to that and are just going to say, okay, how are we going to make it? Not, you know, that's too hard that's not possible. I don't like to hear those um, words in my team. It's how can we make it? How can we find a solution? Um, they're the things that matter to me. And I think just also when building a team, um, yeah, like Axel was saying, um, you know, I, you know, designed the concept, but I left details for people to have their input because it's really important for the team to feel like they contributed to the sculpture too. Um, uh, so yeah, that's really important to me too. And also like communication is key in a team. So being upfront with everyone, having open communication, um, working out like how you're gonna resolve conflict because conflict happens we're all individual people with different backgrounds and it's, it's just really important to, um, you know, if I'm leading a team, I just have to lead by example and keep the communication open and keep talking to my um, team. Um, and if conflict arises, like collaboration can be difficult. I'm like, that's, that, that's just part of it. Um, but it's, it's about how we're going to work through it. Um, how are we going to come together? Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, that's, that's all on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to rush really fast through this. I'm just keeping an eye on time. Um, but the important thing to understand is that no, no, no one here speaking builds these things by ourselves. These are community builds. Community is a key part of everything we do. And as well as our build crews, there's like a massive community that support our build crews around us as well. Um, the best way to find a crew is to join a build crew. So if you don't know where to start, then join a build crew, um, volunteer, and you'll meet all awesome, beautiful people, have a great experience, you'll learn stuff, and then you'll also network. Um, I think it's really important to have a safer spaces, a safer places policy, and a conflict resolution procedure, as Mel mentioned, but that you communicate that at the start and that you um, make it really easy and there's a formal process. So if someone is having issues, then it's an easy process to go through. Um, and also you want to make um, you know, your communities welcoming to diversity, um, obviously around gender, um, 
race other issues. So um, make sure that you're, um, if you don't understand some of the complexities around there, then maybe check, check in with people um, to help you. Um, and I can send you some resources if you contact me around that. Uh, it's important to check in on people regularly because you know it is hard conditions they may be having personal challenges that are unrelated that may be affecting them maybe there's you know stuff happening outside of your build hours that are affecting people um etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, make sure you appreciate people i mean they're volunteering to help you so it's really important to actually be thankful regularly and to always make sure that you're celebrating people and making them feel valued because they <laughs> that you're not building it without them. Um, and it's really important also to think about what's in it for them. So they may be there for the experience. So at that point, you've made sure that they do have a good experience. So you wouldn't just then give them all the crap jobs, for example. You, I tend to do the crap jobs myself where I can. So then that way I'm trying to get my crew to do more of the fun stuff. Or um, as Axel mentioned, if someone wants to have some creative input and, and manage that bit, then let them do it because that's a really, great experience for them. They're going to get up in the morning and go, yay, I'm going to be building art today and they're going to go and do it. Um, and also learning. So um, making sure that everyone learns stuff. So for example, with the chainsaws um, on our crew, everybody was expected to use the chainsaw. So if anyone's like, oh, I couldn't use a chainsaw, it's like, well, you're using it. I mean, obviously if they assist, they don't, but, and then the pride for a lot of people to then use the chainsaw, learn how to use it and then conquer that fear or whatever was stopping them was hugely empowering for them. And so it's that learning and that experience is really valuable for some people. And so it's important um, to also be looking at how you can improve people's um, experience. And then things like maybe you invite other people to light it rather than light it yourself. So that that amazing experience of lighting up a sculpture is experienced by people who have helped contribute. So I'm just noticing we're over time. We're meant to break at 5.50 to have a 10 minute break. So sorry, we missed the questions on this half. Um, so we'll try and speed up the second half a bit. So we'll come back at two o'clock. So you've got a six minute break to go and have a pee and do your things. And we'll start back here at three o'clock. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Axel. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome to log off or stay on. This video will stay live uh, while we let everyone go and have a little break. Um, so we'll jump back into it. Um, and we'll try and speed up a bit. So we've got a bit of time for uh, questions. So I'm going to dive straight into it. So we're going to talk about basic fire behavior and fuel loading. So this, this half of the workshop is getting a little bit more technical about the actual art of fire. So the obvious thing is fire goes up. Um, fire is a chemical reaction uh, caused by heat. So heat rises. So therefore, generally fire goes up. So it's important um, to design where your ignition placements are, whether it's one or multiple placements, so that generally your fire is going to go upwards. And also designing with accelerants, and we'll talk to that a little bit about that, so that you can control the direction of where your fire is going. So the basics of burning timber are three key things. One is the solid fuel, so the wood itself. The surface area. Um, so that, for example, small sticks will burn better than a big log. It's the surface area and also oxygen. So they're the three elements that you want to bring together to create a really good fire or intense fire or one with big flames. So the other thing to really think about is you also need enough fuel in your um, loading to actually demolish the structure. So if you don't have enough um, smaller stuff in there to burn the bigger stuff, the fire will go out and your structure will be standing and it'll be a crappy show and you're left with an unsafe structure. So it's important to be thinking about that. And we'll be talking a little bit about the fire show later, but I'm just gonna share screen to show you some examples of um, fuel loading. Okay, so the effigy 2015. So if we look at this structure, you can see that we've got these big timbers. They're massively solid timbers, but there's not much there. There's not much volume. Um, so that means that as a fire, this is going to um, have not much volume of fuel. Um, so it's actually not going to work very well. 
And when it's burning, if we look at it there, you can actually see in that structure, we've loaded a bit of fuel at the base to uh, facilitate that. But this piece was actually a high risk of um, not collapsing. And I think from memory, we actually had a, one of the fire in fire gear chainsaw the back end of it out um, on the tail end of the burn so that it would fall because we can't have an unfallen structure because it's extremely <coughs> dangerous, something that's been burnt. Um, so in this case, this would be a bad design as far as fuel loading, um, you know, how the positives, but in that context, um, but there's some great learnings. Now I'm just going to jump to the fire seed, which I did the following year. And you can see the structure that I'm building there. Um, and the next picture is this is an, this is an experiment of how much fuel we could and oxygen we could put into a dense area. Um, so we designed that to, to load as much pine in as possible, but then heaps of airflow. So you can sort of see from that structure, airflow, huge, uh, as much timber in as possible, um, but then also using smaller pieces rather than big pieces. And the result of that is quite the opposite to the 15 burn, is um, a flame that was just as tall as a 12 metre structure, even though it was a, five, a four metre structure because we're maximizing my fuel surface area and oxygen. So that's something to think about when you're burning. Um, would um, Axel or Mel like to speak to that? No, I think you covered it for that point. Yeah, let's make it snappy so we can- All right, let's questions. go. Um, material sourcing and environmental impacts. Yes, sir. All right, so I tried to utilise as much recycled material as possible um, because, like, I just, <laughs> I like to think about the environment. So if we're going to burn the sculpture straight away, um, it just makes me feel better if I know that the wood's already been used for a purpose and then I'm reusing it. Um, so a couple of points on when collecting recycled materials is you want to try and get untreated where possible um, so that you're minimizing um, chemicals in the air that people are breathing and unpainted timber as well. I mean, um, it's better if it's raw. And just get creative with the materials of how you can utilize different recycled materials or you know how you're gonna how you're gonna use it. It's there's so many different ways to use materials and to source it in a more ethical way. So yeah, over to you, Axel. You're on mute. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Find some recycled materials that are cheap to get and build your sculpture out of that. Um, in 2018, I found a really good source of kiln dried um, hardwood and it, it can be pretty much found anywhere. It is um, what they import um, stone, like um, granite stone in and they import it from China, I'm pretty sure, but they use a heat treated pallet um, and you can get those pallets all over the country. So. If you want next to, next to nothing, just cheap pallets. Um, it only costs you the, the, the amount that it costs you to actually pick them up, um, but they're all over the country. So yeah, find yourself a good cheap material and go with it. Yeah, for me, this is a whole workshop, so I'm probably not gonna comment to it. I do, um, I have explored the environmental impacts on, on the, uh, forest rising on my website. We've also got a video where we're talking in detail about materials. Um, and if you are at a stage where you're um, asking about materials, then contact me and I can fill you in on that. I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about banned materials, um, stuff that we aren't allowed to burn. And this is Matong Pacific. So this is different to say Burning Man that has different restrictions. We're in a, um, a flammable forest in Matong, so we've got much more stricter context. Um, also remember that these are um, strict rules. If you can prove to the fire safety people you can burn safely, then they'll bend the rules. But this is a really good guideline to get you going. First one is anything that's not predictable. 
If the fire safety people can't predict what's going to happen, you can't do it. Explosives come under that, besides needing to be licensed to use explosives, but anything that's potentially explosive. Um, our big issue at Matong is embers. Um, and so in that context, we've had all material that's smaller than one of your fingers is banned. And this, um, this is because it can half burn, then go airborne with the updrafts, and that's your dangerous embers. Um, if you've got smaller timber at the base, that's less of a concern than if it's at the top. Um, the thing that really upsets me is that means straw is banned. Um, straw is an amazing material used in Europe for this artwork, um, but we can't use straw or anything similar. We can't use paper mache or anything similar. Um, we can't use cloth materials, that sort of stuff. Um, plywood's controversial. When it burns, it can, especially if it's flat and it fires underneath, it can burn and then flake off big embers. Uh, it's controversial because it's a key building substrate. It's a key, uh, such a um, powerful building material. So therefore, it's important uh, part of a, a um, medium. So yeah, that, that is going on in the background. So in that context, probably try to minimize your ply at least. Um, and you're not allowed to use any thin ply for obvious reasons, uh, for the same reasons. Um, and try to keep our toxicity out of it. Um, that hasn't really been a rule before, but um, me personally would be trying to push that more. It's like keep all the toxic stuff out of it. And over to Melissa for building at heights. Um, as we kind of touched on, um, if you're if you don't have much experience in building um, large sculptures, good to start small. So think about. Um, the height, the maximum height of the sculpture and what you're going to need to help build it. So, you know, ladders have certain heights where, you know, then if you go, I can't remember the exact height, I'm not a builder, but um, you'll need to get scaffolding once you're over a certain height. I'm sure Axel can uh, chip in there. But, um, you know, I would suggest not going more than five metres. Um, and make sure you're uh, on top of safety. Um, there's a lot of old school, you know, people who don't really care about their ears and eyesight and do crazy shit, climb sculptures. Um, like if you're the team lead, you're responsible for your safety of your team and the ethics that are involved. Um, so basically you get the final say and it's, I just believe it's really important to have a focus on safety. Um, shit happens basically. Um, and accidents happen and I just like to try and avoid accidents because it's not great if your team member, you know, pops a nail gun in their hand while, you know, working at heights. Um, so you know, also like last year we had a little slip, for example, it just happens. Um, so, and it's also harsh conditions. So all of the factors need to be, um, you know, just thought about and yeah, just plan ahead. Uh, as I mentioned before, building your sculpture in pieces um, that can be kind of joined together. Um, so we built the head on the ground and then once it was uh, finished and we made sure it wasn't too heavy, uh, we were able to lift it up um, using like rope uh, pulley system on our scaffolding and then lift it up with manpower just into position. Um, so yeah, and just be mindful of the height, uh, sorry, the weight, like the, the weight of uh, the different elements um, and what machinery you'll need uh, to assist you with that. Over to you, Axel. Yeah, with working at heights, I would just say don't do it, you know. It, like there's some things where you kind of have to work at heights, um, but for most of the things that you're doing at Burning Seed, um, you can design it, like Mel said, you design it in pieces and then you lift it up because as soon as you start working at heights, you've got to have scaffold and all of this other stuff kicks in. You know, I, I ran into problems where I had people who were on my crew from overseas and they couldn't actually work on a scaffold because they weren't covered by their travel insurance. So they weren't allowed to work above two meters sort of thing. So 
everything takes 10 times as long when you're up at heights as well because you've got to have all the safety precautions in place. If you can build your sculpture on the ground in bits and then, you know, you can walk around it and do whatever you need to do, then lift it up. That's what I'd suggest. All right. So designing a fire show. So you could just build a sculpture and light it up, but that's pretty boring. Um, we're putting on a show here. Um, how our whole medium is about the performance. So um, I use the term fire choreography, and it's the same as designing a stage show, and the fire is your actors and your character within your show. And how is the fire going to behave? Where is it going to start? Where is it going to travel to? How is it going to travel through the piece? We aim for the big sculptures, probably about a 40-minute show. Uh, any longer, it gets a little bit boring. Um, it's important to think about how you're igniting it. Um, for a few reasons, aesthetics, but then also how, how then is the fire going to travel from the various points? Because obviously it only goes upwards, so you need to uh, work out that. And our work is like a trance DJ. Like the drop is really important part of the music piece. And so how are you going to drop it? When are you going to drop it? Like when is the piece going to drop? Um, and that's the dra dramatic part. So all this sort of stuff um, you're designing. Now, if you've never done this before, guess. Um, I mean, even now we're guessing, uh, this is an um, ed educated guesses on how things are going to behave. So just design it. And then when you're talking to more experienced people, they might go, yeah, that's, I reckon that's how it's going to happen. Or they may go, no, I don't reckon that's how it's going to happen. Um, the thing is, if you don't design your show, there's a lot of pyros at Burning Sea that are involved and then they'll design it for you. So I think as the artist, you, that's, that's the bit that you want to um, <laughs> make sure you're doing. Because all these excited pyros will then want to um, burn it for you. And um, would Axel or Mel like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I'm big on kind of uh, telling a story through my art. Um, so, you know, some of you might have been at Burning Seed last year. And we actually decided to do a, like a dance um, and storytelling of the actual um, sto Aboriginal story behind Wild Heart and the lizard sculpture where we were together for the Friday night burn. And, and it was just a really beautiful process um, for the team especially to be involved in, it felt like a ceremony to me. And, you know, we put all of our energy and time into building this sculpture so the the burn is like really important and really meaningful. And for me, it was quite transformative um, just for myself, like within myself. So um, yeah, the performance to me creates meaning around um, the artwork, which creates a uh, connection with people watching it. And they're also part of the community and part of the art. Um, one of the things that's important is like thinking about how you want to light the sculpture when you're actually designing it and, and when you're building it. Um, so for me, I really wanted the uh, wings to go up first. Um, so we, we put some fuel load onto the side of the wings and intentionally lit the wings first. And um, we also created like a cavity where the heart was so that there would be... Um, flames coming from the heart so yeah intention of how you want to light it and how you want to see it go up in flames is yeah excellent um what is it what we uh fire show fire show yeah Make, make something happen. Make something happen in the burn that no one expects. Make, make people go, I didn't expect that, you know. I, I'm glad in 2017 about things move during the burn and that everybody likes something that moves during the burn, like a pub tree or something like that. Um, and I incorporated that into 2018. I had um, some big roof sections sort of lift up and fall out you know everybody loves that stuff everybody loves that stuff so try and try and make it you know choreograph as much as you can there's a bit of, there's a lot of unpredictability um with fire 
uh, because you know there's a lot, there's so many variables. But you know, try. You can always try, it and then you can perfect it on the next one. Yeah, and that's a segue to animation. Um, so for me, animation is extending that fire choreography, um, and it's going to bring more life to the show than just the fire. So there's a few ways of doing that. One is structural weakness. So you could weaken the structure in certain ways so that where those bits will burn out first and then it will fall a certain way. So, um, for example, you may have wings and if you wanted the wings to fall off, you could just um, put intense flame under those joints and then the wings would fall off first, for example. Another technique that I like to use is to have gravity elements that are um, held up with rope or other weak structures that will burn out and then they're held on gravity. So when the, when the ropes break out, then, then it will animate. So that was the technique Axel used in his temple and the one that I used in the fire seed. Um, I've done two experiments with puppets. So steel works really well in these fires. So you can use um, pulleys, um, steel cable, um, steel itself. Um, and so for example, I made a, a puppet phoenix um, in the forest rising piece that then flew above the uh, piece while I was on fire. Now, animation also increases safety risk. So you're more likely to have a bigger exclusion zone, which doesn't bother me, but if it bothers you. Um, and a big thing to always be brainstorming about is catapults. So if you've got bits that are moving, can they act like a catapult? Is it possible that there's a bit of timber that will hit on that and then fly out into the crowd? We don't want burning chunks of wood or bolts and fixings getting flung into the crowd. So you really got to, if you're doing animation, you're really brainstorm about making sure that you're not creating any sort of catapult movement. And I will segue uh, to gambling. Um, and this is something that I'm really into. And this is like pushing our medium to the point of failure. So for example, um, the fire seed um, that I did 2016, two out of three effects failed. 2015 effigy, all of our gas works failed. 2018, the Phoenix puppet, the wing mechanism failed. Um, I managed to get that back to life uh, doing something else. Um, but for me, if we're not pushing the limits to failure, it, it's boring. Um, now I'm not saying we should aim for failure, but we should be aimed to be pushing and experimenting so much that, um, and we're happy if it doesn't all go to plan. And with all the ones that I just mentioned, no one noticed. If you asked anyone in the whole community about that, they'd go, oh, that was great. I didn't see anything that didn't work. Like people don't see your failures. They're just uh, invisible. So don't be afraid to take risks, to do things that you're not sure you can get away with, um, as long as it's safe, um, so that um, you, you're really pushing yourself and pushing the meeting. Um, and then I'll move to demolition over to Axel. Axel, demolition. Are you there, Axel? Um, we've well, seen we've lost him off the line. No, he looks like that. All right. Um, Hello. Yeah, are you there? Demolition. Demolition. Um, so the rest of about demolition, uh, you know, things flying out, things hitting people. Um, you know, you, you basically just if you're demolishing your structure, um, you just want to make sure that it's in a controlled manner um, and that you have all your safety in place, all your perimeter in place um, so that no one gets hurt, I guess. I don't really have that much to say about demolition. Yeah, I, I think um, demolition is a key part of the um, artwork because you want to design how it's going to collapse and how it's going to fall. Now, in traditional building demolition, uh, uh, perfect demolition is where a structure falls in on itself. It's just far more safer. So that's generally something that we aim to, but you may have an artistic reason not to. Um, now, for example, the 2015 effigy uh, that I showed you before was designed for high winds, as Mel has been explaining. So we've got these really um, strong structures that can handle high winds. Um, we need to actually um, help to the fire to actually to demolish these within 40 minutes. So one of the techniques we use is to chainsaw big chunks out of it. So we're reducing the structural integrity. 
We can also put more intense accelerants around weak points to make sure that they burn much more intense over those weak points or putting more fuel load on those weak points to make sure that they'll burn out and burn out in a, in a, a fast way. So, um, so some pieces will just burn nicely and you don't need to think about demolition, but if you've got a strong structure, then you'll need to also design within that how you're going to actually drop the structure. Would you like to comment on that, Mel? No, you covered it there. Beautiful. All right. Uh, accelerants. Okay, so we're going to cover here more the design of accelerants than the safety. Um, accelerants are extremely dangerous and in a lot of contexts illegal to be doing this, so um, be careful. Um, now, we use accelerants because we're putting on a fire show, and so they're a really key part. Um, we use accelerants to make fire go sideways. So again, it usually goes up, but if you need it to travel across, then we use accelerants. Uh, we want it to accelerate the fire um, because we want to get it going really fast and intense quickly so that we can, or, so we can get the actual thing to burn within a certain time. You also want to get those heats up, the heat up of the fire and make an intense fire so you can also help with the um, structural integrity and the demolition of the burn. And also the aesthetic um, show as well, like how's the fire going to behave? And you can influence that with um, using the accelerants. Now in burning speed, unless you've got experience with the, um, the accelerants, then you won't be allowed to do that. You'll be managed by someone who does have experience, simply because they're so dangerous. Um, but that's fine. If you've got uh, an idea of how you want to choreograph the accelerants, you don't necessarily need to understand them. You can say, oh, I want to do this and then I want to do that. And this bit needs to go and then that bit. And then someone who, with that experience can help you design what sort of fuel that we're using. Now, I just do want to mention some of the fuel that we do use. Um, traditionally, um, petrol is never used by itself. So petrol is just what you put in a car. So if you YouTube, um, people lighting up bonfires and they explode on YouTube. You'll, you'll see heaps of those. Um, that will be petrol. Petrol is very, very, very dangerous um, because what happens is that it gasifies. So you pour petrol on something and it creates a big gas cloud around it that you don't see. And then you put a flame near it and it will explode. Extremely dangerous. So we don't actually use petrol um, in a pure form uh, um, burning seed. And I recommend that you don't play with petrol in that context. Um, diesel, on the other hand, uh, gasifies less and is far more stable. It's a slower flame. So generally we'll use diesel as our main accelerant and then maybe mix a bit of petrol in it to, to speed it up and do this bit. And again, there's experienced people above you that will manage that. Um, now I pledged to phase out petrochemical accelerants a few years back and we've been experimenting with various fuels. One of my favorite ones that are coming out of that is cooking oil. Um, so we go to a local fish and chip shop or hamburger joint and get um, chip oil. Um, that is super safe because it needs high temperature. You need another accelerant to actually light it. So uh, while you're handling it, it's quite safe. Um, but it does produce a really intense hot flame. Um, it's really uh, useful for aesthetics and also demolition. Um, and I'm trying to find a source of biodiesel to actually use as the accelerant to light that. Do you like to comment any more on that, Axel or Mel? Yeah, I um, I really am on on the same page with Glenn as well. And we used um, recycled vegetable oil uh, on the base of our sculpture as the starting point. Um, one of the one of the fuel loads, and it was um, sourced. We we teamed up with um, the other team and sourced it from a local pub. Um, after they've used cooking. So it's not just bought from the shop. Um, and that was really effective. And in combination with a couple of others. But I, I just want to mention it, it's just, um, it's really great to like imagine like what you, how you want it to be on fire. Like what do you want people to see? Um, and then work backwards from there. So, like, I really wanted the wings to be, I wanted a phoenix. I wanted it to morph into something. And, like, so we, we worked on, you know, lighting, lighting the wings um, 
as one of the first points because they were um, across. Um, um, if we just lit it from the centre, it would have taken a while for the, the wings to lie and it would have had a different effect. So, yeah, it's, it's just great to imagine what you want to, um, to see it um, be like. And, um, yeah, I think we kind of covered that some things fail. Um, we had flamethrowers coming out from the, the mouth of the, the bird and it failed. So we, had, we just went to plan B, which we'd already, like, planned for before. Um, and yeah, I also had a lot of help from other experienced um, members such as Glenn and other people at Burning Seed, which really just helped um, put our plan together. So you don't have to have everything um, prepared around the fuel load and ignition um, before you go. You can develop some of that um, when, you, when you get to the festival. Yeah, can I just talk to your picture in the background, Mel? If you look at that and by default, that, that um, pyre down the bottom will start fire and then the fire will go centrally up the centre of the bird, leaving the wings. So that's why it was important. I mean, if you look at it now, this is far better effect than that. Um, and that was through design and through um, the work to make that happen. You're the fire artist. Um, would you like to comment on that, Axel? Um, mainly around just the accelerants that you're going to use. Um, if you are planning to use something that's dangerous, you basically just won't be able to do it. And there is a lot of people on site who are there to actually help you achieve um, what you what you want to do. And you might think you need a lot of accelerants, but you probably don't need as much as you think. Um, from experience, um, I've, I've overused accelerants and I've underused accelerants. So... Um, yeah, there's a lot of people in the fart who will help you um, with with making your sculpture burn. Lots of pyromaniacs who want to make it burn really nice as well. So there's plenty of advice out there if you just have a bit of a look. But the more that you learn and um, direct it as an artist, the more power, more control you'll have of the vision. And I think it's important as an artist to have your vision and fight for it because if not, other people may influence the piece. Um, ignition. All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about actually lighting the fire um, and a few different ways of doing that. Um, one method is electronic ignition which is basically you've got something that sparks that's run by power. Now, most of the traditionalists refuse to use this because it's, um, they fail. The, and there's been many times uh, we've seen where the ignitions have failed, so therefore you then have to go to manual lighting. Generally, if you've got fireworks within the structure, you'll, you'll probably by law need to use ignition because legally you can't get close enough to it. Um, now, assuming that you 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 just got solid wood and basic um, accelerants, then whereabouts are you going to actually put that the torch? Where are you going to actually light it from? How many ignition points do you need? Is that going to be one person that's going to light that one ignition point, or are you going to have multiple people um, igniting it? In what order are they going to ignite it? If you wanted to do something that's higher, do you get just a really long stick um, and stick it on there? Do you have an archer that's skilled enough to fire something like that? Well, the safety <laughs> people do it? Probably not. Um, but for example, um, you know, Ramstein does a technique that I've always wanted to use where they um, have steel cables and then they put rockets on it. Um, looks awesome. Um, I don't know if I'll let me do that either. Um, but how are you going to light it? Um, it's really important part of your fire show and also your demolition and how you're going to run. And I saw this great one at Blazing Swan last year where they did this very pagan-like ceremony. They um, had the training during the event um, and a heap of people were involved. There was quite a lot of them. And they um, started somewhere in the festival and they all had the robes and they had the um, torches. They had a ceremonial possession to the temple. And then they had a very quiet, solemn ceremony where they walked around it and lit it up. And that was a beautiful effect. Um, and uh, Mel... And Pete did a beautiful um, ignition last year, which involved um, theater um, and storytelling. Another thing just to mention as well, um, is that 
you know, fart have the final say. Um, and, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and also another element that we haven't mentioned yet is because the um, burning seed is in the state forest. Um, last year, for example, on Friday night, when our burn was meant to go ahead, there was high winds and it was too much of a risk um, to burn the sculptures and for the embers to go into the forest. So we didn't actually burn on Friday night. Um, we, we burnt on another night um, and we still had to prepare um, everything as if we were going to light it. Um, and it was, it was disappointing, but it's, you know, we're there to also be safe and to look after the forest and the people. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, and yeah, you know, that's what it's about. Yeah, and I'll just follow that up as well, is that every single aspect of this, every single aspect needs to be signed off <laughs> by the <laughs> fire safety manager um, and also site manager. And, a and there's a few layers of people. So um, unless you're coming with a real focus of um, safety then um, and working with the safety people, it's not going to work for you. Um, so, yeah, you really got to come in here with the attitude of um, safety as a priority and then working with the people, taking their advice, trusting them. Um, they will, they will um, you know, they are flexible if you can prove it's safe. But, yeah, you definitely. And I just want to shout a big love out to FART, Fire and Art Response Team, um, because, yeah, they are straight edge for three days and nights um, and keep us all safe um, and do a wonderful job. So, big love to uh, FART. Would you like to... Mention anything, Axel? Uh, just going back to your your ignition and um, like the show that you put on when you're doing the ignition as well is is very important. Um, I know how powerful it is to actually light one of these, like your sculpture yourself. And um, in 2018, I got the whole crew together to go in with their own sort of torches and light it up and that was a really powerful thing so you know have a think about how you're going to light it um like glenn said you know make a show of it and you know it could be really powerful okay um i'm just going to quickly gloss over fireworks um so if you're going to use fireworks you need a licensed pyrotechnician without um negotiation we are unable to get any licenses for any airborne fireworks due to um, the nature of the forest. So you may, and also you'll need a long lead time to actually, you and your pyrotechnician to actually get permits um, to do it. So if you're thinking about fireworks, you can only do them within the sculpture, not airborne, and you'll need a pyrotechnician and you'll need time to go through permits and stuff. I generally don't like fireworks. I think it competes with the um, art, but that's your aesthetic and up to you. Gas effects are far more accessible. Um, and there are a few people on site that will, um, they like helping people. So you would need to negotiate with them. If you want to do gas effects yourself, that's very complex. Um, you know, in a simple context, you just run gas through a line and ignite it and it goes. Um, but as far as doing it safely, it's extremely complex. So if you're willing for a steep learning curve of learning um, gas safety, then please do. There will be people at Burning Seed that will help you with that. Otherwise, you may need to find a partner to do your gas effects. Uh, any other comments? Fireworks. They're a lot of trouble. Too much trouble. Well, I spent <laughs> a fortune on fireworks in my budget last year, and they all failed. Uh, we had a ignition system that was, because we had fireworks in the thing, we had an ignition system that failed. So mm. all, all the fireworks failed in that system. So I think I'll be just be going back to gas from now on. <laughs> and also sometimes gas fails. Yep. <laughs> um, last year, as I mentioned before, we had a flamethrower and we forgot as a team, we forgot to check um, the line before and something had fallen on the line. So it failed. Um, so it's good to just check everything right before the burn. <laughs> In 2015, we had the most elaborate gas show that Vertex has ever seen about to go off, except for... <laughs>
Um, over to you, Mel, talking about mentorship. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to um, encourage you to find a mentor. If you have don't if you don't have much experience or none at all or you're trying something new, um, it's just such an awesome way to learn. And you can literally just approach someone who inspires you um, and they'll either say yes or no. So um, find someone who's really open to sharing knowledge um, because nothing is a secret. Everything's been done before, just in a different way. So, um, yeah, find someone who's open to helping. Um, enjoy the process as well. These are my final tips. Um, it's a festival. It's about community, um, sharing and having fun as well. So while it's important to, you know, plan everything and, you know, have a focus on safety, it's also having fun. Um, and, yeah, just like having open communication um, is just uh, can be such a save um, for me. So, um, and also just learn from your mistakes. Like shit happens. Sometimes things go wrong. Um, things don't work. And it's just, I find it's really good for me to have a, a like a positive attitude um, to resolving it and just learn from it. So yeah, I just really encourage you to um, pitch your idea and just go for it. And um, yeah, with mentors, there's quite a few people in the Burning Sea community that want to help people. And my advice to you is to do your homework, do the work and ask smart questions and heaps of people help you. If you're being lazy and asking dumb questions, then uh, people will be less enthusiastic to um, help you out. So yeah, there are a lot of people. So don't be shy to ask. Um, ask within the networks or the Facebook pages, et cetera, et cetera. Should I comment on that, Axel? Yeah, um, someone who has been involved with the builds. Try and, you know, if you can't get on a build, find someone who has done a lot of builds um, to give you advice because, you know, that's very valuable. Uh, I had a mentor um, getting involved with Burning Seed, so, you know, I'd highly recommend it. It's definitely what you need. Do we want to shout out to questions, um, Kat? Absolutely. Uh, we've had one question in the chat box about budget, which Axel has responded to by text, which is quite helpful, asking what is a sensible budget range to start out with? Axel's response was, uh, if you're going for the art grant, that's a really good range to start at. Have you got anything more to comment on that, uh, Glenn or Melissa? Yeah, I mean, Artery has a heap of structure around um, applying for grants. So yeah, I'd be looking at Artery and, and shooting questions to Artery because at the end of the day, the Friday burns are managed by Artery. So they'll be um, the other ones doing the grants and managing. Um, so maybe you would have something to say to that, Kat. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, I haven't even got my video on. I better start that so you can see me. Um, Artery does have a grant round process. So we do announcements on Facebook mostly, but also via email, you can sign up to get email alerts when our grant rounds open. Uh, we're hoping to do that around February or March next year, uh, all things going to plan with the global pandemic. And also um, just keep in mind that um, from my understanding, Kat, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you know, your budget needs to be more than the actual grant that you're applying for. So um, you need to, it basically doubled um, in a short answer. So, you know, there's different levels of grants, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, it just depends on what you're going for. So if, for example, if I was doing a $2,000 um, grant application, then my budget would be at least 4,000 minimum, um, four to 6,000 total. Um, and, and then so I would be like fundraising or chipping in my own money as well um, to make up the rest of the money. Um, and Kat, do you want to mention about the, um, 
like just how it, it labor is not covered yeah that's a really good point and um, we've also had a new grant uh tier come in last year which most people wouldn't know about because it didn't happen uh seed funding so it's a small cash grant so it will be between 300 and 500 dollars to help people make models I really enjoyed all three of you saying how important it is to make a model and make it to a scale so that you can burn it. And that will definitely help in your application process. If you can show us a video or photos, uh, particularly of the fire sculptures that you're interested in burning, um, you can apply just with a sketch on a piece of paper for that seed funding. And that will help you develop a concept um, that will potentially get you the full grant funding. But yes, we don't pay for labor, we pay for materials and we pay for transport. So uh, the more you can recycle, the more secondhand stuff that you can get on the cheap, the bigger the scope of your project can be. And we also cover things like truck hire, um, petrol to get out to the burn uh, and return. Um, and we can also talk through things like insurance, um, you know, if you need to have insurance in the place that you're assembling it, maybe it's your share house backyard and um, all the complications around that. Was there, um, did I cover all the uh, question there? Yep, sure did. <laughs> uh, and also it tears, if there's a 1,000 and a 5,000 tier, you don't have to go for 5,000, you can go for two or three. So it's anything under the amounts. I know that um, the Mel Burners also have grant rounds. So if you are from Melbourne or from Victoria, um, you can also apply to those guys for partial funding for projects. I was just got a question from Jace about the, um, about whether be, um, people looking at the support structure of the um, design. Um, obviously your structural elements are a key part of the artistic process. So, um, you know, you've got to make it set stand and safe, but then you also want to make it aesthetic. So that is part of the design process. Ideally, you're hiding your beams or making them look like they're meant to be there um, as part of the design and that's part of the process. I'd like to have a comment on that too. Um, when the thing is burning, the, basically the only thing you can see, you can see in, um, in the background of Glens, you can see all of the structural beams and things like that. Um, that's basically what's left when all of the cladding is burnt off. And that's the majority of the burn is all of the structural stuff. So you want to make sure that that is pretty. Um, because you will see that you will, you will see a silhouette of all your beams and your um, all of your timber so yeah you, you can't just hide like a horrible frame underneath a really pretty cladding because all the cladding will burn off really quick and you'll just see this horrible burning stick frame looking thing yeah you got to design the skeleton as well as the body Any other questions, Kat? Um, I don't have questions for you guys, um, but we have a reasonably small group. We've got under 20 people. If people want to just jump in, unmute their mics. Yeah. Looks like you guys have covered all their uh, answers. Can I just ask one quick question? And that's um, how much of your planning is meeting a brief? Like, you know, the theme of the burn that year, for example. Uh, I often personally don't like themes. In my, I think themes are really important for a community because a lot of people don't know where to start. And a theme is really important for some people to give a structure and where to start. Um, I generally don't like them. Um, what we usually do is retrofit them afterwards. We go, here's what I want to build. How do I make it fit the theme? Um, probably the only exception is the one behind me where that was um, revolution um, was the theme. And so I did design the theme on that one, which was, you know, um, you know, the fossil fuel patriarch that's, that's controlling the world and the revolution is going to burn into the ground. 
and I think it's good to like find your own meaning as well within your own sculpture um like yes you can relate it to the overall festival theme if you feel a connection to it um but for me it's it's finding my own meaning and my why like what does this sculpture symbolize for me you know And and did the Galar have a have a meaning beyond like the um, First Nations story that like gave it context? Yeah, for sure. Um, so like I had my own meaning for the sculpture. Um, it was called Wild Heart, and it was about just like unleashing my own wild heart and my fire and my phoenix within. So for me, it was really symbolic. Um, and I actually just pitched that idea individually um, on my own. And then I was contacted by, you know, Artery and another team saying, hey, we're actually building a lizard and there's a whole story. And we just saw that you pitched a, uh, a bird sculpture. Would you like to combine it? And we can do one um, Friday night art burn. Um, so that's how um, my sculpture became part of like a collaboration. Um, and so it had, it actually essentially had a double meaning. Um, so there was a story about the two of the artworks together. Um, but for me, the artwork also had its own meaning. Any other questions out there? So free. I'll admit that, uh, you know, here I am over in the States, <clears throat> but I was at the 2018 burn and that, that uh, temple was ridiculous and that the whole hinged aspect with the rope that you were describing earlier, Glenn, just I, the, the work you did, Axel, was just that. Was there something that inspired you to, to cause that kind of hinged effect that you saw before that that then made you bring it into your uh, burning practice? I mean, Axel. Yeah, it was, it was um, the work on Glenn's one the year before like you know <laughs> I, you, you always go to you know burns or events and you see other artists doing things and and yeah. you end up your concept is this conglomerate of all of those sort of inspirations and because i had specifically worked on glenn's one um my one was just it was almost like a elaboration of it or you know and um, moving parts or just basically moving parts, weighted moving parts. So, and then Glenn, where was your inspiration from that one? Well, in that context, it was about exploring animation. Um, and so I wanted, I, I talked about the fuel loading at the start, like how I wanted to actually build a big intense fire with as much fuel, oxygen and surface area. And then I was like, but I want to animate it. So I had a core and then I was like, well, how do I animate it? And so I was just, like tying with concepts and then um that sort of evolved to a uh, sort of lotus like flower um because i like flowers i'm working on one at the moment um and then what animation would a flower look good in the structure that I already had um and then when i folded it up it just sort of looked like a seed and sort of made sense to you know call it a seed because during the festival it was, it was more of a, the seed so that's more just pushing like what how can i animate and what you know, what techniques can I use? And Thanks. Axel, what about the telescope feature of your temple, like the sacred geometry and those ideas? Where did they develop? Um, just my imagination, really. Um, I wanted um, sort of a central sort of focus point in the middle. Um, looking back at it, I probably made it a little bit too trippy. There was just trippers underneath it all the time. Um, so it, it was beautiful, but it was it was too beautiful. You, you can make these things a little bit too detailed, do too detailed and, and too trippy looking for people because um, there was just people under there having knots and stuff in the temple, which it should have been just this nice sort of serene environment but it was too trippy looking for a lot of people. <laughs> Axel, did you intend that um, when the, that temple did that, um, to have that amazing noise? Was that part of the design? 
No, no, that was, um, it was, it just happened. It just happened because of all of the fuel load and stuff that we put underneath it. So the, the roof sections actually came down and, and crushed all of the wood and stuff that we'd loaded up all around the base. Um, so yeah, it was, wasn't part of it, but um, it was a definite, you know, exciting moment when it all cracked open because it, it very much cracked open. But I built those, I built those pieces in like full scale in my backyard and had my son lifting them up and down just to make sure that they were balanced and things like that. And they're about eight meters long, I think. So yeah, they were very heavy. And when they crushed the timber, it made quite a noise. Can I just to respond to the sacred geometry that you mentioned in the question? Um, just to mention that all of my work, except for the dragon puppet, was based on, on sacred geometry principles. I think all of Brad's work, who's a prolific um, burning seed builder, um, most if not all of his work, and a lot of Axel's works on sacred geometry. I just want to um, explain sort of why. Um, the sixth side is as close as you get to a circle, is if you go from five sides, it doesn't quite look like a circle, but when you get to six, it sort of gives you a bit of a circle-like effect. But then once you're using that six, all your angles, um, of the, the geometry is much simpler and, they, it more, and it lines up. And when you're working with those six start style geometry, you'll notice that things just magically um, line up as you're designing. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I love the aesthetic of it, but also as a builder, um, that six geometry, um, two, three, six, um, works really well in, in, um, in building 3D sculptures. Especially temples. It, it creates like a resonance um, when you use sacred geometry um, and it's very, very powerful. Uh, you hear people feeling a lot from the structure when they're surrounded by this sort of sacred geometry. Um, and layering it up, just layer up the sacred geometry so you just, it amplifies the energy. It's actually strong as well. Amazing. So uh, we've nearly done the whole two hours. Is there any last comments or questions that the participants would like to throw at Axel, Mel or Glenn? I think you've um, answered pretty much all the questions there, guys. That's a successful workshop, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, and I've got to do a big shout out um, to the, the Fire Sticks Alliance. Um, you know, we've been sharing knowledge about fire um, uh, for two hours, but our knowledge is very minimal compared to the traditional owners of uh, Australia. Um, and my research has shown that they were very prolific uh, burners. They did a lot of work, a lot of burning of the landscape as land management and a lot of wisdom and depth of knowledge. And fortunately that's been ignored and has taken catastrophic bushfires for them to suddenly be listened to. Um, and Fire Sticks is a really important um, organization to start um, empowering cultural burns. Um, so I really recommend that you donate to them. And also want to send a big love to Far, who manages the fire safety, but then also um, the Department of Public Infrastructure at Burning Seed, um, which makes it possible for us to, the infrastructure for us to work within, and also the kitchen crew, which feed us, and without them, we would die on site. Um, and then all the punters who actually pay their tickets and um, help fund and support our work. So um, big love to the community. That's brilliant. Absolutely right, Glenn. It's a community effort and I'm so excited to be part of this community with you all. And I'm so excited to see what kind of designs everyone's going to bring to the next gathering we can do. That's uh, all the questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Glenn, for pulling this together. Thank you, Axel and Melissa, for all of your knowledge. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all back on the virtual paddock. And I look Bye. forward to seeing your pictures and your burns on the paddock.